This episode of the HVAC School Podcast is made possible and brought to you by Testo and Carrier. Thank you to Testo and Carrier for being such great partners with HVAC School and technicians who are out there doing the work every single day. And if you are listening to this on the internet, on YouTube, anywhere other than in a podcast app on your phone, I would suggest pulling out your phone right now. Just you can hit pause, just hit pause right now and then pull out your phone, pull out your phone. If you have an Android phone, download the Stitcher app, type in the word HVAC in the Stitcher app and hit subscribe. If you have an iPhone, look for a little purple tower that says podcast, go into that app, type in HVAC and hit subscribe to HVAC school. It's a much easier way to listen to the podcast. If you're running, you can listen with headphones. If you're, if you're in the car, you can listen with a auxiliary cable or with Bluetooth. There's a lot of different ways to listen, but the idea of a podcast is mostly that you can listen to it when you're doing other things, when you are otherwise occupied and you could not watch a video. Like for example, when you're driving it between service calls. Hey, yes, this is Brian, and this is the HVAC School Podcast, and you are one of the really weird people who sits in your service van, probably, at least I'm hope, I hope you're sitting in your service van and not in bed. I had somebody tell me the other day that they listened to my podcast in bed, and that really creeped me out. Like, just the idea of that whole scenario just isn't, isn't good. And yes, I did say, scenario. Anyway, so thanks for being here, and today we're going to talk with James Bowman. He's the technical director for Rector Seal, and James is a really down-to-earth guy. He's a really enjoyable guy to hang out with. Uh, we had a coffee at Starbucks together at the HVAC Excellence Conference, and so once again, it's it's a little noisy in the background, um, but I think you'll enjoy James. And uh, this is a little bit of a stretch for me in, on topic. So I, I have to at least just confess this right off the bat so that when you're listening, you realize the emotions that are, that are going through uh, my soul when I hear this. Because I've never been a big hard start guy. I, I've never been a huge fan of, of putting hard starts on, on functioning systems. And I was even one who would always say that you can't put a hard start on a scroll compressor. I've since learned that it really doesn't make a difference whether it's a scroll or a recip. It's really just a matter of making sure that you match the proper hard start kit, uh, potential relay, start capacitor to the right unit. And we talk about this quite a bit in this episode. And uh, there definitely are some considerations here. The other thing I want to mention is, is that whenever there's something that I haven't tested or I don't know, I, I like to tell you that. And I tell you that not because I'm wanting to throw anybody under the bus, but if there's something that I don't know, I don't want you to think just because the guest, the person who I'm speaking to on the podcast, just because they say something, that doesn't mean that I know it to be true in all cases. And so there's some of that in this episode. Uh, in general, it's all good sound stuff. And actually, James was the RSES Speaker of the Year in 2015. So that proves that he is uh, at least experienced uh, out there on the circuit teaching technicians. And so here we go. We got James Bowman talking about hard start kits. <laughs> All right, so we are sitting here in Starbucks in uh, Orlando at the Florida Hotel. Mm -hmm. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. Second day of HVAC Excellence. And uh, James gave a, a uh, remarkable presentation on ductless systems. And so I guess to start with, tell us a little bit about you, what you do, where you came from. You know, start, start at birth. Start birth? Well, at a very early age, I was born, <laughs> I actually grew up in the Midwest in the farming community, decided to join the Army after high school, and uh, ended up at Fort Hood. Well, after I got out of the Army, went to Houston for a while, then went to Florida for a while, and I, that's where I got into air conditioning in the early 90s. Was an install helper, lead installer, then moved back to, Flor moved back to Houston. And I just worked my way up. I just figured out a long time ago that I'm lazy. See, the trick is this. If you want to know how to find the easiest way to do something, ask the laziest person you know. Well, I'm the laziest person I know. So well, you ask yourself. Yeah, ask okay, myself. Yeah. And just, you know, I, I don't want to stay where I'm at. I always want to move to the next level. I always want to do the next thing. Well, that next job, well, you get a promotion, that's got to be easier, you know. So, of course, I messed up my knees in the Army, so uh, so eventually I'm, I had to get out of the, get out of the attics. Uh, four years ago, I left the contracting side of the business and join Rector Seal. My official title, which, you know, that and four bucks would get you a nice cup of coffee at Starbucks, is National Technical Manager HVACR. I'm basically the trainer, corporate trainer. So I spend 30 weeks a year on the road 
doing technical training, continuing education training for contractors, technicians, wholesalers. I go into the schools whenever possible because, that, you know, as we've been discussing here at the educator conference, the schools are the schools are vital for for the future of our industry, um, and and getting these schools equipped to to produce a good a student is vital, you know, and I also am a firm believer that that we've got to help the schools find good good students to start with so that they can turn out a good product that the industry wants. So that in a nutshell is my life. I travel, I train, I go home and do laundry. <laughs> wow. Laundry. Yeah, laundry's not in my wheelhouse. I, I yeah, I don't even know if I know what to do mm. with that. All right, so I have to first make a commitment to you because I owe you one. Yesterday in the in the class I uh I, I kind of I kind of let a couple jabs fly, and well, hey, uh, <laughs> that, I have no. As you can tell, I have no problem with that. You you give it, I can take it. Uh, and if you're not giving it, well, you're taking it because well, I'm going to give it right back. Well, that's and that's the agreement that I'm going to make here is that uh, you know you brought up a good point that if you give it to me here, you know I can just edit it out. But I'm not. <laughs> I will intentionally not edit it out. So. Uh, I, you know, you're, you're a little tired after a long day yesterday, so I don't know how sharp you're going to be at, at giving it out. But if any of them come, I'll, I'll make sure to leave it in the podcast for the benefit of the audience. Well, now I'm going to be worthless for 10 minutes because my mind's going to be trying to come up with something. <laughs> come up with something. Yeah, there's a lot of ammo out there, but you probably just don't know me well enough to have pulled no, it up. So I, you could always do it later. You know, once back, you, Your background check is due in next week, so I haven't got, <laughs> okay. haven't got the info yet. Okay, yeah. Uh, it doesn't even take that even that much. All you got to do is just talk to somebody who works with me and you'll find out plenty. There's a lot of different things we could talk about. I mean, obviously, Rector Seal makes a lot of different products. You're involved in training with a lot of different products. Here at, at this event, you're talking mostly about uh, ductless systems. That's kind of the, uh, you know, Rector Seal makes a lot of products for ductless. Mm -hmm. One thing that's come up a lot in HVAC school, it's just a kind of a recurring theme, is hard circuits. Mm -hmm. So start capacitors, potential relays. What kind of triggered the initial conversation was a conversation that I overheard um, when I was at the AHR conference about three wire capacitors mm -hmm. and not to go into it too deep but but the thing that kept being said was is that well a three wire um, three wire potential relay and, and all potential relays have multiple wires that's not the point the point is that you connect three separate wires so you connect it mm -hmm. to the common side uh, in addition to run and start the comment that was made is is that well that common connection is a ground so i'm doing air quotes here is a ground and that just set me off because the guy was essentially pitching that that a hard start needed a ground and it's not safe if it doesn't have a ground and of course we know that that common is not a ground at all <laughs> it just it just connects it, I, if it's if it's a ground you don't need a hard start at that point <laughs> right? it's a little too late yeah you have another problem so that's kind of what started the conversation which got me looking more into hard starts I, i'll admit that i've been fairly anti hard start most of my career and it wasn't really a well thought out opinion it was mostly just um, my experience of guys who were installing a lot of hard starts was that they didn't really know why they were doing it and they were just kind of throwing it on everything and it felt sort of like a sales job to me. You commented on the site about the difference between the th what, what's called the three wire, three wire hookup versus the two wire connection. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. And obviously, just for full disclosure here, Rector Seal sells the, the Kickstart, Kickstart, product. Yeah, Kickstart product, which is the product that we use in my business. So it's the one we've used for years. And, you know, with all, all transparency, we've had no problems whatsoever with it. We've just used it in a very limited sphere. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of set you up there. And so now you mm -hmm. can take the ball, sit it on the tee and kind of knock it down the fairway from there. Well, the first thing we have to understand is, is when we talk about hard starts, not everything that's being sold as a hard start is a hard start. The definition of a hard start kit is a mechanical potential relay connected to a capacitor to aid the compression starting. If it doesn't have a mechanical potential relay, it technically, by the technical definition, isn't a hard start. The most popular two wires out there are these very, very inexpensive PTCRs, positive temperature coefficient resistors. They're cheap, so therefore people buy them because they're cheap, and they have a reputation for being compressor killers. Right. Exploding. And then, yeah, they, yeah, and plus the fact that they, they do more harm to the compressor than they do then they'd help. Now, let, let's clarify. If we're talking about fractional horsepower refrigeration, the PTCR is a vital part of that of that system. Okay, it's part of the safety circuit. But when we get into residential one to five ton single phase compressors, a PTCR is at best a soft start. It's not going to drop out or pick up at the appropriate times. 
So at times, it's not even going to be in the circuit. When you have short cycling, when you have brownouts, it has to cool off before it can before it can work again. So therefore, it's not helping you. When it when it is working, it takes so long for it to heat up. Compressors long started, and 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 all that additional time that the capacitors in the circuit is adding heat to the start winding. Everybody has to understand, not all two wires are created equal, and a soft start, a PTCR, is not a hard start. So let's just take PTCRs off the table for residential equipment, which is impossible to do because they're so cheap, but in my mind, let's just take them off the table, okay? That brings us back to the remaining two-hour technology. The remaining two-hour technology falls either under a mechanical potential relay or an electronic relay. Electronic, you can't, in a small, affordable package, make electronic that reacts fast enough. It can read, but it has to react. And, and, and you know, let's take meters, okay? Some of the best meters out there we've got, the flukes, the field pieces, the, you know, the testos, all these, all these high-end meters. You take these meters, and if you if you look at them, even your most expensive meter that the average technician will use in, in the field, it has a reaction time of about 0.5 amps, or excuse me, 0.5 seconds. The design for a compressor is that the start circuit, the start cycle, is 0.4 seconds or less. Okay, so that means that we need something that's going to be able to. Help the compressor start, the compressor start in four tenths of a second or less, and we're back out of the circuit. So from elect electrically, if we look at meters just trying to react, read that reaction time, we're not doing it. So we have to go to oscilloscope. Now you can pick up a decent oscilloscope for 700 bucks, but now you're adding $1,500 to that just to get probes that are, that are strong enough to handle the voltage and amperage that we're measuring. So, and then, and then it's huge. So to take, turn around and take electronic and put it into a little one inch by two inch box that's going to react fast enough uh, and remove these from the circuit at the proper time, it just really can't be done, okay? They try, there's a lot of good products out there, but, but ultimately they trigger what I call timing, de timing devices, no matter how you read it. Essentially, you're, they're just triggering a timer because it, they have to they have to time it out real fast, and so almost all of those will go 0.5 to 0.6 seconds and then time out. So they're not necessarily reacting fast enough in some cases. Then you have the true mechanical potential relay, the kit like the kickstart, where it's the same mechanical relay that's used in in three wire start kits have been in use forever. Okay, the difference is, is we're measuring the voltage between run and start versus common and start. By doing that, uh, we can eliminate a lot of relays because the back, the back EMF that's being fed or, or, or being produced between run and start is fairly consistent among all single phase one to five ton compressor, less than 100 volts. But if we measured back EMF between common and start, which is the way you do it in a three wire, uh, it varies by hundreds of volts. That's why there's hundreds of relays. So there's nothing wrong with a three wire device. The problem becomes if we try to tell you that three wire is universal, it's not. Po it's impossible to do with the current technology. It's just it's just not possible to do. Right. If it had been possible, manufacturers would have done it a long time ago because that would that means they could have used less relays. That would have dropped their cost down due to volume. Because back EMF is designed into the run to start circuit due to our voltage limitations on capacitors. But that gives us that means that compressor manufacturers can't design the back EMF between common and start. So they have to figure out what it is after they design and manufacture the compressor, then specify a relay to match. So that's that's how can we can get away with two wires. It has nothing to do with safety. It, it has to. It has just. It has to do with convenience, the ability to have a universal aftermarket that that has a mechanical relay. We can carry less products. If you've got a warranty, you got two stage equipment. Use the, use the OEM three wire. I mean, use the factory three wire. That's what it's there for. Uh, but if you're choosing to carry a aftermarket product on your truck understand how all these technologies work 
so that you know that you're you're picking the right technology. The way that they're trying to get away with being having a universal is they've purposely set the pickup voltages lower than the average. So if you take all the pickup voltages out there between common and start, right, or all of the, the back EMFs and what they should be, and then you just average them out and drop that voltage, we're not going to damage compressors. Right. But we're also not going to help the majority of the compressors that we actually are connecting to. I tell guys all the time, it's like, this is the easiest way to do it. You go out there, you take it, you take a compressor, take it 10 years old, one year old, it doesn't matter. But make sure it's got no start kit on it. Short cycle it, check the amp draw. Put a universal three wire on it. Short cycle it, check the amp draw. Take it off, put the kickstart on it. Short cycle it, check the amp draw. Now, the beauty of that is, is by the time we get to the kickstart, we're working a whole lot harder. So that compressor needs more help because our amp draws aren't even being higher. And I, and, I, and I will guarantee that in the majority of the cases, your kickstart's going to lower your your startup amps significantly more than than a universal three wire, right? Because it's 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 just the way we're reading back EMF. So a couple things that I want to I just want to back up and address a couple things technically because I think there's a lot of techs who may not even understand what a potential relay is doing or what a start capacitor is even doing. Okay. Within a potential relay, you have the actual coil of yes. the relay, and the coil of the relay is wired in such a way between phases, so that when that motor starts to turn. Because when a motor starts to turn, it actually acts as a power generator. So yes. when you see, this is a this is a huge confusion I think by most technicians. When you see that voltage spike coming out of a capacitor, say when you read between you know start and common, start and run, when you're reading off that off of that perm terminal, say for your compressor, and you see that higher voltage, a lot of guys think that the capacitor is somehow creating that voltage, but that's actually back electromotive force, which just means back voltage. It's a simple way of saying that it's being generated by the motor itself. Yes. That motor is is actually creating that. And so when that motor first starts, it doesn't have back EMF because it requires the turning for it to be a generator. A compressor's true locked rotor amps, like its true start amps, mm -hmm. are the same regardless because it's a start amps are the resistance of that motor. So if that motor is just a heater sitting there locked, so say you took a condenser fan motor and you grabbed the you grabbed the blade and just stopped it. And you, and you read that amperage, that would be locked rotor amps, meaning nothing's turning. And so when a compressor first, first very first nanosecond, it's going to be the same whether it has a hard start in it or not, but that's not when you measure. No meter measures in the first nanosecond. It's not possible. That's, that's only a single instant. And so what a hard start does is, is that when a motor, and this is getting a little techy, but when a motor first starts up, it requires more capacitance in order to create the proper phase shift. And so you have a, a capacitor that needs to be appropriately sized, not for when it's fully running, but for that first 75% of running speed, or approximately. And so that capacitor is going to be, it's larger, so it creates a greater phase shift. But now that large capacitor, you can't keep it in when you get to 100%. Otherwise, you're going to have power factor problems out the wazoo. It's going to, it's going to burn up the winding, right? So you have to get it back out. And that's where connecting that coil across, in the case of like Kickstart, they're connecting it between start and run. In the case of a three wire, they're connecting it between common and start, start and common, and that back EMF is then is then picked up in that coil, which then opens the relay. A lot of people think that a potential relay closes. It doesn't close. It starts closed. It's normally closed, and then when that back EMF is generated, that opens that relay and takes it out of the circuit. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about here is when you're sizing a hard start kit, you have to think about at what voltage at what emf does this do these points open up at what point in time does it open up and take that out of the circuit and at what point in time does it come back into the circuit and those are the considerations when sizing that potential relay mm -hmm. but then you also have the consideration of sizing the actual start cap itself which is another consideration and that plays into why kickstart doesn't have just one it has a couple different options mm -hmm. even even though the actual voltage the potential relay doesn't change that much. It's more so the capacitor. So I'll let you speak to that. Well, you're right. The capacitor size does does make a difference. You got a lot of um, technical knowledge. Very very technical guy. You got a lot of technical knowledge. I don't have the same technical knowledge. Okay. Now I spent 20 years as a technician, an installer, did all that. 
I'm, practical. But I didn't. But I didn't spend the. T- but I didn't. But I didn't go to school and, and learn the theory behind it and learn all the right. symbols and and right. so so sometimes when I talk it it's it's more it's field speak. Right. Okay. So when I say, you know, the capacitor really has one job. Our capa- our capacitor has to hit hit that compressor hard as it can, then go back to sleep till the next time. Okay, that, okay. that's really that's yeah, really what that's we have true. to do. Just okay? true. It's doing it through so, shape, yeah, but absolutely. You know, we actually size our capacitors a little bit higher than what you're going to find a factory kit. Okay, with Kickstart being an aftermarket, we have to ensure that we're going to help that compressor start every single time we're applied. And so, therefore, we will put a bigger capacitor on there. We do have a smaller capacitor for smaller units, bigger capacitor for bigger ones. Let's assume for a second that a compressor will produce 400 volts back EMF between common and start. So, once they determine that, then they will size a relay that that the pickup voltage will be approximately 300 volts, uh, 29310. 283, 320, somewhere in that range, it will pick up. It will open the circuit. When I'm in my classes, I like to demonstrate. I'll take a, a, a stack of business cards or something and two stacks side by side, and I'll take my, my tea glass and set on top of it to, to visually see contacts closed. And then when I when I, and, and demonstrate, when I'm the coil in that relay and I see that 300 volts, I, I pick up, and then you can physically see where now my circuit's open. Right. Um, so pickup equals open circuit. Pickup equals Simply. open circuit. Right. Yeah. Um, which is something that, that we have to learn to understand because then, you know, and, and the, the trade schools have taught me that. When I go in and I start talking this and I'm not thinking and I start using terminology that doesn't match, you know, the students are even more confused than they were to begin <laughs> <Right>. with. So <laughs> the instructor whacks you over the head with the racked, uh, with the racked manual. So pickup is when the circuit's open. By the same token, that when the compressor shuts off, we have to be able, we have to put that relay back, that, that capacitor back in the circuit. So we have a dropout voltage. So as the compressor slows down, and as uh, it's producing less voltage as it's shutting off, all of a sudden we re- we hit that dropout voltage. The magnetic field disappears. We close the circuit. We drop out. Ready for next time. Ready for next time. Yeah. And the beauty of that is, is this happens instantaneously. So that if we have a brownout, if we have the thermostat bump, somebody slams a wall on a mercury bulb thermostat and it goes on and off, the relay can react fast enough that we're going in and out of the circuit. That noise you hear is James. Demonstrating. Yeah, he's demonstrating with his iced tea. He's a, he's yeah. a big iced tea Sorry. man. Forgot. I thought I was on TV or something there. I, I, forgot, <laughs> I forgot you can't see me uh, slamming the table with my tea. Hey, it works though. No, my, I don't know my, where I'm my we're bad. talking about fishing, I'm right? A bad, <laughs> I'm a bad host. Yeah, <laughs> fishing. Yeah. So, what do you catch? Here's the key thing for a, for a technician out there: there are products on the marketplace that get abused sometimes, and the Hard Start Kit is one of those products. And you'll talk to different people, and they'll tell you different things, and that's and that's a challenge because as a technician, you don't know what to believe, and so then you just say, "Forget it. I'm not gonna. I'm just not gonna deal with this." And there's a lot of products like that. Understand that, a, that the concept of a start capacitor and a potential relay and a hard start kit, which is the combination of the two, is absolutely tried and true technology. This is there is no question that this is a good thing because if you think about what it's all it's doing is when you have a run capacitor, nobody would dispute that a run capacitor is a good thing. Everybody would say a run, yeah, you need a run capacitor, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the run capacitor is just a capacitor that's sized for running balances out the power factor. And I've showed this with the with the testo meter and everything. When you have a properly sized run capacitor, then your power factor shows properly when you have a meter that can measure that. A start cap deals with the power factor, deals with that phase shift that's necessary in order to keep that motor running uh, efficiently and get it up to speed quickly during that first 75% of the range. Because the run cap is way undersized for that. Mm-hmm. That first 75%, the run cap does not have the capacitance for that motor that's turning more slowly. Mm-hmm. And so... It's absolutely tried and true. The only question on the table here is who does it best? That's really the question. Who who sizes them best? Who, who sizes the capacitors best? And who connects the potential relay in the most effective possible way? And what you're saying is, is that there are actually significant advantages to connecting that coil in between run and start as opposed to connecting it in between start and In the and aftermarket common. application, the advantage is, is that I don't have to carry 12 relays on my truck. 
that that's the advantage. It, it, you know, if you're if you if I if I was to say, let's go down to local wholesaler. I said, here's a model number. It's four years old. I need the factory hard start kit. They're going to go back. They're going to pull a box off the shelf. Inside, it's going to be a relay, a relay, a capacitor, and some wires. Okay. Now I come back the next week to the same wholesaler. I got a different model number, same brand. And I go to them and I said, I need a factory kit for this one. They're going to go get a box with a relay capacitor and wires in it. But are they going to be the same box? No, they're going to be different because the relay. Back in the day, when I started, we had to put in, and I'm not that old. I just, you know, it's just a term. I easily to. only 94. I mean, that's my, that's my uh, estimation. So if I need a start kit, I would get a relay, a capacitor, and I'd get my wires out of the junk pile. And we'd go put it together. And if I was a service technician, I had I had an easily, and this is just residential service technician, I had easily 12 to 14 relays in my truck. I mean, you go look at a commercial refrigeration guy's truck today, he still has 12 to 14 relays in his truck. Because when you're trying to, to, to measure back EMF between common and start, you have to have the relay that matches 75% of the back EMF between common and start. And that varies greatly between all compressors. Absolutely nothing wrong with three wire start kits. Yeah. Nothing wrong with three wire start kits. If I'm going three wire, I'm going factory. I'm going to the factory. I'm getting the kit that they specified for their compressor for that model. And I'm doing it that way. If I go and try to get an aftermarket product to do that, it's just not physically possible to do. You cannot replace. I mean, the Copeland handbook has 125 relays in it. Now, granted, now granted, half of those are for their small refrigeration stuff. But that leaves a whole lot more for all the rest of their compressors. You're replacing all those with just two relays? It doing the exact same thing? It's not possible. You can't do it. It just I mean, I don't I don't care how you look at it. Uh, and you can prove it yourself. Like I said, try one of these universal three wires. And there's multiple brands on the market now that are trying to, to tackle that three wire market. I mean, we've been selling Kickstart since two thousand eight when we bought the company. We could have brought out three wires, we could have brought out all we could have brought out PTCRs, we could have brought out timer devices, but it doesn't make sense because of how they work. So therefore, we're going to stick with a tried and true method uh, that truly works as an aftermarket. Um, Frankly, I have not done the independent testing, mm -hmm. but I've looked at the research that you've done. You have a really good presentation on this subject, and uh, and it looks sound. So for the technicians out there, I have a lot of guys who like to test this stuff. Um, do what James is saying. You know, test yeah, it. You know, test absolutely. it with competitive capacitors. See where it's pulling in, where it's going out. But then also, an easy way to do this would be. Your next 10 service calls you go on among different units, mm -hmm. check between common and start and check between run and start and see what the variation is. And then that's, and that'll give you a good indication. Um, based on Rector Seals testing, what they've seen is that there's a significantly greater variance between common and start than there is between run and start. So I'll, I'll do that test on, you know, whenever I actually get out fixing things with real tools and stuff. But for those of you out there, go ahead and do that test and, and, and you know, see what you find. Now, from another standpoint, as far as an advantage of start kits, it's outside of, uh, of, of the true of just helping it start is imagine every time you get in your car, you leave your starter engaged on your car an extra quarter to a half a second every single time. How long is your starter going to last? That's the thing with these. Your, that, your start winding is your starter. I mean, it, it, it essentially. So you keep adding heat consistently into it every single time you start it. So that's the advantage of, of looking at an aftermarket. Either when you install a piece of equipment, order the factory start kit to put on it then, or if you're out servicing equipment, there's significant benefits to just going ahead and adding one properly sized, one connected properly to the circuit, whether it's a factory three wire or whether it's an aftermarket like the Kickstart. But if you're using an aftermarket, take the time to understand what is PTCR, what, is, what, are, what are these electronics, what are these so-called universal three wires. Look at them, understand them, so that you can make the decision as what's best for your customers when you're using an aftermarket. Yep. A couple other things that I want to mention, and Joe Shearer um, talked about this in a previous um, episode, just kind of some best practices. One challenge that can occur with hard start kits is that when you have a hard start kit in place, that compressor is going to start even if your run capacitor isn't 
working properly. Uh, yes. That yes. does come up. And so the one thing that I suggest to people is if you are going to put a hard circuit on, make sure that you have a good quality run, run cap on it yes. as well. Just That's do vital. that at the same time. Um, you know you know which ones tend to have more problems, and you know the good ones that hopefully you're keeping on your truck. Just make sure you got a, a, run, a run capacitor that's both properly rated and that is good quality, one that's not going to fail on the customer. Well, let's talk about run capacitors for a second. We remember when, when the cheap imported run capacitors hit the market a few years ago. Huge, huge problems. Well, it created problems for start kits as well, all right? So we did after we did some studying, we, we, we realized what happened, and we, we got to figure out why are not guys checking their run capacitors? Well, it turns out guys are checking their run capacitors. I mean, they're using a meter to check the run capacitors, right? We got capacitor checkers. Well, the problem is when you have a capacitor and the, the layers of the sheets that, that have insulation between them, if you have a weak spot in the insulation, you're going to get bleed through. Okay, and that bleed through will actually bypass part of the capacitor, thus causing it to have less capacity, less microfarads being a weak capacitor. The problem is, is that our capacitors work day in and day out at 370 to 440 volts. But yet we're testing them with a nine volt battery. So the weak spot not, this may not necessarily show up when we're testing it with a meter but we test it under a load that 370 volts, if it's gonna bypass, it's gonna bypass. You're gonna see it, it's gonna show up. So the proper way to check for a capacitor, which is actually easier. I hated checking capacitors. You gotta pull off wires, hope you don't break the spade clip. You, you know, Sometimes you gotta take the capacitor out because there's no space. Um, now leave it running, check the, check the volts to the capacitor, record them. Check the amperage on the start winding to the capacitor. Record it. You take your uh, your amperage times a constant, 2654. Divide it by your uh, voltage. And it's going to tell you exactly why, what that capacitor is doing right now under a load. If it's 60, if it's rated at 60 and it's reading 52, you've got a weak capacitor. It's showing it. Now you turn around, shut the unit off. Pull out your capacitor, check it with your meter, and see if it's a, if it's telling you the same thing. Um, but if we consistently check our capacitors this way, a we're going to find a lot more capacitors before they fail completely. We're going to save our customers energy. We're going to increase our our revenue, uh, and it's all around win win for everybody. Plus, we're going to damage less start capacitors, start kits, uh, by having good quality capacitors. All right. And that's what it, what it comes down to is if you test a lot of run capacitors, you're going to find a lot that are weak. I mean, that that's <laughs> if you start doing it, that's what you're going to find. And when you get below that six percent, um, that's when it's time to you know to definitely have that conversation because you're outside of manufacturer specifications. Mm -hmm. I would even suggest though, and this is maybe pushing the envelope for some people, but if you see a capacitor that you know to be the type of capacitor that you're seeing fail day in and day out, and you're putting a hard start kit on a system, it may be just as good to say, look, I've got a good quality you know, U.S. made capacitor here that I can use. And so we just don't run the risk of this failing because you are going to, it isn't good. You know, if you have a run cap fail. The problem is when it fails, it may, it may destroy your, your start kit. So, right. you know, now you've, now you're throwing good money after bad at that point. Right. So, because what will happen is the, the, what, or what can happen is that start capacitor is going to start the compressor. The compressor is going to ramp up to about 75% speed. It's going to drop out. And then that compressor is going to stall because it's under load, it's a fairly high torque motor, it's gonna stall, it's gonna go back in, the, the relay's gonna pull back in to keep just, just back and forth, back and forth, back. If you've ever heard one doing it, it's not a it's not a pretty it's not a pretty sight. So that's one consideration. And then the other applications that I would definitely and, and obviously different people are gonna have different thoughts on this, but this is this is just my current state and this has changed even over the last year, is if you especially when you have hard shut off TXVs. You know that when you have hard shut off TXVs you should have a, a hard circuit in place. When you have a reciprocating compressor with long line sets, um, in a lot of cases you should have, um, and you can look at your manufacturer specifications. And when you're installing a new system, and when you're installing a new system under warranty, like you said, a factory kit is probably gonna be a better bet. But when you show up on a site and you see these applications where the compressor is only starting, you know, one out of five times or whatever the case may be, and, you see, and we do see this. So it sounds like maybe I'm exaggerating, but we see it all the time in commercial applications where you have 208 
volts. So you're already slightly derating that compressor. Mm -hmm. You have long line sets, you know, over 50 foot line sets. And because it's 208, it's undersized wiring. And so now you have compressors in a lot of cases. You have these, you know, condensers up on a rooftop of a three story building and they've got these, you know, long vertical runs and then it's 208 volts and you'll go up to them and, you know, they'll only start every so often. You know, how many times are, are we pulling a good vacuum? Now all of a sudden we're shifting here to vacuum, right? What the heck? Okay. <laughs> Have you interviewed interviewed Dave Boyd yet? I haven't. No, but but yeah, happy. Put him on your list. Yeah, happy Put him on your list. Be a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we're not changing our oil frequently, we're not pulling all the moisture out. We may get to 500 eventually, but we're not we're not getting all the moisture out of the system. Okay. So moisture stays in the system. It's not enough to to create so much acid that that we're burning out our our, our compressor. You know, in six months. But there's enough low-level acid in the system that over years, the acid is actually traveling through the system, etching the soft surfaces of the copper, and then that soft copper is now floating through the system looking for a, place, a home. So it's attracted automatically to the hottest surface in the system, which is your crankshaft. Mm -hmm. Now you're starting to copper plate your crankshaft. Now so we walk up to a unit that started fine, worked fine for eight years, no problem. Now, all of a sudden, it needs a start kit. Why? Probably a pretty good chance that one of the issues there is that the, the, the crankshaft has now been copper plated to the point that it's starting to bind. So now it needs a start kit. All right, so in today's tool tip, I wanted to talk about uh, something that I think gets missed more often nowadays than it used to, which is compressor oil. And and I think it might have something to do with the fact that vacuum is getting so much play nowadays. And maybe it's just in my little circle of friends. But So we talk a lot about vacuum and acids and copper plating and sludge and all that that goes along with not pulling a proper vacuum, not evacuating the system properly. But the idea of compressor uh, oil is something that I'm not hearing quite as much as I did for a while, and, and it is an important factor. And so, specifically, we have you know we have two different conditions that, that occur quite often, even in residential systems, and that is a flooded start where a compressor has a significant amount of, of liquid refrigerant that is migrated into the compressor before the unit starts. And when that happens, then you have that that uh, liquid boils off as soon as that compressor starts and starts to compress and get hot and all that that liquid refrigerant boils off and then it foams the oil and a lot of that oil is lost out the compressor and so the compressor oil levels go down significantly and then you have uh, this oil foam and that's that's a bad thing but then also you have the issue of oil being washed out of the compressor while it's running and this happens um, with what we call flooding you know flooding during running and flooding during running is different than a flooded start because a flooded start occurs just because the compressor is, is cold. Uh, if you have a, a climate where it gets cold at night, and that happens a lot, obviously, the unit shuts off, and so you have a lot of liquid refrigerant that migrates outside, and then that's how you get the flooded start. But when you have a flooded condition while the system is running, that happens because you have zero superheat. You have liquid refrigerant that's running down your suction line. And in modern systems, as we employ electronic expansion valves and thermostatic expansion valves, we have less of that because that's the job that they do is making sure that you have uh, that you have the proper amount of refrigerant going through the evaporator coil and so you don't overfeed the evaporator and end up running liquid down your suction line. But we still have a lot of fixed orifice systems out there. And, and we're not just talking about uh, traditional residential systems. There's a lot of fixed orifice commercial roof packs and, and other types of systems that as well that utilize fixed orifices. And when that's the case, airflow over the evaporator is an extremely important factor. It's extremely important in all systems, but for different reasons. If you have an, a, an expansion valve system and you have low airflow, well, it's just much more likely that that system and, and a high temp system is just going to freeze up more often than it should because that expansion valve is going to slam down. But in the case of a fixed orifice system, if you have low airflow, meaning you're, you're giving the evaporative coil less heat capacity, you're exposing it to less heat than it's designed for, then you can end up with liquid refrigerant in the suction line, which over time can wash oil out of that compressor. It's not the old traditional, when we used to say, you know, slugging a compressor where you hit the head with liquid refrigerant. That's not common in the case of residential air conditioning because that liquid refrigerant dumps into the compressor crankcase and it's pumped out of the crankcase into the head. So it's very, very unlikely that you're going to get liquid refrigerant directly into the head. If you did, you would know because it would be uh, bad times. 
but it's much more likely that you're going to get liquid in there and it's going to foam the oil and then over time you're going to lose a, a good amount of your oil charge and then that's going to result in your compressor um, running short on oil which will then result in locking over time so when you're thinking about hard start kits a lot of times you may need a hard start kit because of acids that were that are in the system um, that cause copper plating uh, but you also may have an issue with your compressor mechanically because you have an oil return problem and that can also be due to piping and that sort of thing but what I specifically want to address is the issue of airflow. And so when measuring airflow, the traditional old way of taking a dry bulb split is so out. It's not that there's no value in a dry bulb split, but you really need to be measuring your wet bulb temperature in order to honestly know whether or not your split is correct, whether or not you have the proper airflow. When I say split, I mean your delta T is the term that's, that was traditionally used for your dry bulb split. But nowadays, I like to see you using a tool like the Testo 605i in the return and supply so that that way you can have a much better idea of whether or not your airflow is actually appropriate or not. You're going to have a much better picture of what's going on because taking a wet bulb split or measuring enthalpy change across the coil is going to be a much better view of overall system capacity. And when you take that into account with everything else, if you take that into account with your superheat and your subcool and your suction pressure and your head pressure, and you can do all that together with your uh, other Testo Smart Probes, then you're going to have a really good picture of whether or not airflow is an issue. Uh, if you add in static pressure and other forms of air delivery verification, like if you wanted to get real crazy and use a large vein thermal anemometer, um, something like that, then you can really get a great picture of, of what's going on with the system. And, and, and again, a lot of technicians kind of get this sense of, am I supposed to do this on every service call? I think you need to do enough to make sure that the system is operating properly. And if you're not testing enough to make sure that you do have proper airflow and that you don't run the risk of A, either freezing the system up because you're running such low uh, suc evaporator saturation temperature, suction saturation temperature, uh, or you're running liquid down your suction line and, and uh, essentially flooding out your compressor, which is what we started talking about, then you haven't done your due diligence. So by using tools like the you know Testo 510i in order to measure static pressure, so you can see what your system is actually seeing, total external static, by measuring your, your split fully, not only can you see your dry bulb split, but then you can see your delivered capacity using a couple of Testo 605i's, you're going to have a much better, a much better view of how the system is functioning as well as what your airflow really is. And of course, this is not a comprehensive look at how to measure airflow, so don't don't get confused. I'm not saying you can just jam a couple 605i's in there and know exactly what your airflow is. It's not quite that easy, but uh, it does give you a really good picture of what's what's up, what's going on with the system. And then obviously, just check your superheat, and then you'll make sure that you're not running liquid down your suction line. All right, that was enough babbling. Back to James. When we look at our systems, we've got to look at the entire system, not just one component. Let's not just say that the start or the, or the 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 run capacitor is the issue. Let's let's not say that the start kit's the issue or not start kit. We got to look at the entire package on these systems. My favorite saying is every solution creates a problem. In reality, everything else, everything you touch in a system will, will affect everything else, and eventually it'll all end up at the compressor. Ulysses Palacios is a is a contributor to our site, and he's he cuts these compressors open, and he shows consistently copper plating inside of compressors. It's on the, you know, it ends up in the in the cylinder walls, it ends up on the pistons, it ends up in the in the bearing points. Anywhere that's getting hot, you get this copper plating. And uh, and that's not designed, you know, you, you and over time, that compressor is going to have a harder time starting. Now, I think sometimes hard start kits get blamed because what happens is you have a compressor that's not starting. Somebody puts a hard start kit on it, starts it, then it runs for a month, and then the compressor shorts. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, the hard start kit caused the compressor to short. No. The hard start kit got a seized compressor running that now shorted. You got a compressor running that couldn't run, but that's because of additional phase shift that you're providing on start that's getting it running where normally it wouldn't. Well, now you still have that copper plating. That's you still of, have that's, that That's kind of like getting a pacemaker and expecting to live forever. Well, blaming the pacemaker when your heart stops, yeah. yeah it's, it's like, it's not, right. uh, you know, it, it, you, you, it, you just fix the symptom of a, of a deeper problem. Right. So, so, but you know, and the advantage of, of looking at start kits early on, we can gain the benefits of reduced cost on startup, um, reduced heat going through our start windings for many years before we get to the point where things, you know, really start falling apart. But then again, let's start even earlier. Let's start even earlier and make sure that we're pulling a good vacuum 
Okay, we're getting all the moisture out of the system. You know, let's make sure that that we're using good practices when we solder and not putting junk into them. You know, let's make sure that we're sizing our wiring properly for, for the system we're putting in. Um, I mean, we, it, it all starts back there. And then, you know, from there, it just, a lot of these other solutions we come up with are just to, are just, you know, pills to, to treat the symptoms of a condition that started back when the day it was installed. Mm -hmm. So that's really where we need to start. Right, right. And so there is a role for, so I'll kind of land here um, in, the, in the conversation with Hard Start Kits here. There's a role for Hard Start Kits in the industry. You're in a position where you need to keep some on your truck. I mean, you just need to. You're gonna have a you're gonna have a locked compressor in order to get that customer air tonight. You're gonna need a hard start kit, right? And so, keeping every factory hard start kit for every single brand that exists is not a possibility. So now the question is, which hard start kit are you gonna choose, and when are you gonna use them? And that's for you and the management of your organization to decide upon. I'm not gonna decide that for you, but it's certainly a conversation you need to have. And you need to look at whatever the best technologies can be in order to accomplish that. And I think I think you've given us some really good things to think about and to, to look at when we're choosing the next product we pull off the shelf. I agree with you. Yeah. And Rector Seal has research. We've got manufacturer reps in everywhere in the country. So if you would like, um, you know, if you want more information, you want you want you know a sample to try out, do some tests. I encourage guys test it, test it yourself in the field. We'll get you a couple samples. You can go out there. You can test it against other products. See if it works for you. If you're happy with the results, you know, don't take my word for it. Just, okay, take my word for yeah, it. Go, but, yeah, you know, That's probably what you'd like, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, try it out yourself. I mean, <laughs> you know you got to see it with your own eyes. Right. You know, you got to try it yourself to see what benefits that you see out of it. That's what I encourage you to do. In any way that we can help, uh, just let us know. We've got, the, we've got technical training we can provide. Uh, we've got support, sales support, and our local manufacturer reps and regional sales managers can provide. We do what we can to, to help you guys uh, make more money in your jobs. So what's and the best way for them to get in touch with you or Rector Seal? How, where do you want people to go? Well, RectorSeal.com is a great resource. Um, we've got a live chat feature uh, on RectorSeal.com that goes into our tech services department. Got uh, an 800 number, which I don't have memorized. <laughs> Go to RectorSeal.com and you'll find it. That's the easiest you know, way. way to use Google. Yeah, that's the easiest way. RectorSeal.com, and we've got a lot of resources, videos, technical data. We've got a very easy to use cross-reference chart, so you don't actually have to do the math when you're checking or your run capacitors under a load. Uh, we've got a lot of resources there, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. And also, if you just Google best-looking, just do a Google bit image search for best-looking bald guy, and then James will come up. Uh, but you got more relationships on the internet. I thought they replaced your, <laughs> my picture with yours. <laughs> That's true. Balding, balding. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James. Thanks, Brian. All right, big thank you to James for being willing to do that, sit down and take some time. He, he was really exhausted. He, he spoke a couple times at the conference, and when he was sitting down, he was literally nodding off a couple times during the interview because he was so tired. We uh, interviewed in the morning. So thank you to James for that. He's a really great guy, and I would encourage you to uh, reach out to him if you have any training needs or any questions about Rector Seal products. I'm sure he would just love to talk with you for hours on end about whatever little tiny questions you have. Uh, you can thank me later, James. Anyway, in addition to that, I just want to wrap up and, and state kind of my current position on the subject so that way there's no confusion. My position would be if you keep a universal hard start kit on your truck, I'm a big believer in the Kickstarter as a good quality universal hard start kit. We've used it. I've tested it. Seems to work pretty well in most cases. Now, it's still better to use the factory hard start kit. And the reason is, is because a factory hard start kit, they're going to size both the start capacitor and the potential relay exactly for that component. And so you're going to, you're going to pick up, meaning you're going to take the, the start capacitor out of the circuit at the right time. And it's going to come back in at the right time. The actual, um, the dropout isn't as important. So if you look at potential relays, the dropout is very similar across a wide range of potential relays. It's much more that, that pickup voltage and the actual capacitance of the capacitor that really makes the difference. So I would say if you are shopping for some capacitors and you're currently using a PTCR or something like that, I would definitely suggest looking at the Kickstart product. I think it's going to do a much better job than, than a lot of the other products that are on the market. Again, that's my opinion. Um, as far as this, you know whether or not it's better to hook from run to start and that kind of thing, I, I don't have a, 
uh, a fully formed opinion on that subject. I did do some testing on the on the matter, and there's a decent amount of variance between run to start uh, on some compressors I tested as well. But I can't speak to exactly why that is. It is a pretty confusing subject. Once you get into sizing potential relays for the design back EMF of a compressor, it gets pretty engineery. Uh, and I do not claim to be an engineer. But what I can tell you is that at least what's being done makes sense. And so you do get a larger voltage between uh, the, the start and the run terminals than you get in between start and common. And so I think it makes it a little more likely that it is going to come out of the circuit um, than if you were going to use a universal three wire. That side of it, it at least makes good sense. It's more like seems more likely that it's going to take it out of the circuit. And you do want to make sure that start kit comes out of the circuit, that start capacitor comes out of the circuit. Because if it stays in the circuit, then you run the risk of damaging your compressor. And we do not want that. So thank you for listening. Obviously, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of opinions about this subject. I'm happy to talk to any of you. If you want to email me, you can email me at brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at hbacrschool.com. Also, I want to mention uh, some of you, I, I'm starting to publish this on the YouTube channel as well. And so some of you may be like, this is weird. I don't understand why I would watch this on YouTube. There's no video. It's a podcast, first and foremost. And a podcast, in order to listen to a podcast, the best way to do that is to take out your phone, go to the Stitcher app, Go to the, if you have an Android device, go to the uh, iTunes podcast app, which is right on your phone. If you have an Apple device, subscribe within a podcast app. And all you have to do is just type in HVAC. Generally, as far as I've ever seen, we're always the first result. Just hit subscribe, and then you can listen to us every time in the beautiful strains of my lovely voice. All right. Thank you. We're going to see you next time on HVAC School.